It almost feels almost more important in this day and age with all of the uncertainty and the defense spending. Would you first of all agree with uh, you know, former defense secretaries that we just have to increase defense spending now? Well, I think we will have to increase defence spending in a, in a measured way over a period of time. Uh, and I think a great deal depends on, post the American elections, what the position of the US is around NATO in Europe and how, how clearly we can rely on the continuing guarantee of uh, the American alliance in the defence of Europe in the future against potential Russian aggression. But there's no doubt we're not spending enough on defence. None of us are spending enough on defence. And we're going to have to find to that into what is already a very difficult public spending uh, agenda for the UK. So what happens to UK defence and European defence if Donald Trump is, for example, elected and says, actually, NATO needs reforming and we're going to give a lot less to it? Then the Europeans have to step up and fill the gap, and that's quite a big gap to fill because we're heavily dependent on the Americans for many strategic elements of our defence. I don't just mean the nuclear deterrent, but um, the ability to airlift large numbers of troops for example, depends crucially on uh, American support. So um, we, we would need to invest quite a lot more money in defence. I think the important thing here is that um, the overall envelope of public spending cannot continue to expand. So when we talk about these things that we have to do, decarbonisation, increasing our defence spending, we also have to talk about what we are going to do less of in order to be able to afford these things. That's the grown-up debate. And to be very honest with you, it's quite difficult to get that debate going in an election year. So how would you do it? You're, you know, you're always look at the numbers and always try to balance out. First of all, defence, does it need to go to 3% of GDP or is 500 million one-off enough? Uh, not yet 3% of GDP. And money isn't the only issue. We've also got to be able to recruit enough people at the moment um, the defence establishment is struggling to recruit the people it needs to spend its current uh, budgets, to use its current budget allocations. So the two things go um, hand in hand. But I think, look, go back to what the Chancellor was just saying about growth. In the end, this is all about growth. If we have strong, uh, consistent economic growth driven by productivity increases, not just by a growing population, um, then we will be able to afford to do more, including uh, over time more public spending um, but first of all we have to get that growth equation right and al although it looks like we are now getting on top of the inflation problem which has been the predominant theme for the last couple of years we still have this long-term challenge in the UK that our productivity growth has been very flat for ever since the global financial crisis uh, and our economic growth uh, is simply not strong enough to support um, uh, an ageing population with a very sharply rising demand for public services. But, but so how do you actually fix the productivity problem? The US productivity numbers are a little bit better because yes, of a large number of, of immigrants actually coming to the country. Uh, does AI help with productivity? How, how would you go around it? Technology can indeed help with productivity, um, but we've got to make sure that we adopt and uh, innovate in the right way, uh, that we seize the opportunities that are available. I agree with the Chancellor. I think the UK growth prospects are significant. We've got a very good track record of technology adoption. British people are very open uh, to, to using technological innovations in their everyday lives, more so than in many other countries. So the, the raw material is there, but we've got to make sure we seize the opportunity. And one of the challenges of democracy, of course, is that we have to persuade people that they want things to change. And people are very conservative with a small c, um, often don't like change, and it's about selling change to people, um, working out how, in a democracy, we have those big debates and we reach the right long-term decisions around these big, difficult issues. Because many of our adversaries and even many of our friends around the world who are competitors with us um, don't operate the same kind of democratic system, don't have to build the same kind of consensus that we do in the liberal democracies 
of, of Europe. Because one of the more immediate, and these are longer term, extremely difficult subjects, mm. very important. On the short term, I mean, does it make more sense to increase defense spending or cut taxes? And, and that could also lay the foundation actually for f future growth either way. Well, look, I'm uh, strongly in favor of an agenda to cut taxes over time as we can afford to do so. But we can only cut taxes if our public spending um, is less than our tax receipts. Driving economic growth, achieving higher levels of economic growth should increase tax receipts and should ultimately enable us to have both lower taxes and higher spending on public services, including things like uh, defence. But we've got to do things in the right order. First, you grow your economy, and that requires investment, yeah. maybe at the expense of consumption. But the consistent theme, if you look across countries around the world that have achieved decent levels of economic growth over long periods of time, the consistent theme is high levels of saving and high levels of investment. And we've got to do better in that area. Once we've done that, and we're running surpluses in our public finances, then we can start looking at cutting taxes. I'm afraid, as um, uh, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng demonstrated a couple of years ago, trying to do it the other way around, cutting taxes first, funding it by borrowing, simply doesn't work.